John chapter 20, beginning in verse 19. John chapter 20, beginning in verse 19. This morning I want to share a message with you from this verse and following verses entitled, The Peace of the Empty Tomb. The Peace of the Empty Tomb. This morning I brought a very elaborate illustration with me. Some of you all may not have caught the joke. Very, very sophisticated, very elaborate illustration with me. I was, I was sharing with my, this story with my family, the resurrection story of our Savior Jesus and how he conquered the grave. And, and if you give my kids a pop quiz, Asher can tell you, he can actually, at five years old, he can pronounce resurrection and he can even tell you what it means that Jesus came back to life by God's power, never ever to die again. All I can say is Myra Powell is really thorough back there in her Sunday school department. Amen. <laughs> but he asked me just last night, I uh, uh, hate to admit this openly, but he, uh, just last night he asked me this, and I wasn't quite prepared for the introduction, and God gave me one. Amen. But he asked me, well, why? Why did Jesus have to come back to life? And it hit me. That afternoon I had been at... Uh, I had been in a store, and it reminded me of uh, some trips that you have had down at Walmart. There comes a time, uh, as things have shifted towards the uh, check yourself out, I guess you're on the honor system, amen? As, the, as you go through the checkout line there, there comes a time where you're scanning things in, and the register keeps dinging, and you look down, and with rising cost, you begin to wonder if you might not have to exchange your firstborn child for, <laughs> before so you can leave. But then there comes a moment in time where you pull out the card, at least I do, and I surrender my credit to be able to pay for the exchange of goods that I am desiring. And to let me know that it has cleared the bank, they give me a receipt, a proof of purchase. And you've got to have that thing, because at least at, least at some stores, uh, not to name any, but uh, initials Walmart, you have got to have one of these receipts to get through the gatekeepers without harassment and to have peace as you walk out. Well, when Jesus gave his life, friends, I want to remind you, God literally did give his only begotten son for us. And the proof that we have that his payment was good enough, the proof of purchase is the fact that he raised from the dead. And because of that, we can live our lives with perfect peace. But you know, the thing is, on a, on a resurrection Sunday like this, Many of us come into this place today, and the truth be told, we're oftentimes not living with that peace. The peace that he purchased, the peace that he made available. Today, from this passage, as we go into John's gospel here on that first Sunday, I want to share with you three ways that we see that we can experience the peace that Jesus purchased here from this passage. Before we read God's word, would you join me in a word of prayer this morning? Father, we come to you this morning, and God, we are so grateful for your plan of salvation, for the plan of forgiveness that you had from before you founded the world. You knew that we would mess up, that we would need a Savior, and Lord, that you decided to give your Son that we could be saved through faith in him. And God, we praise you that you raised your Son from the dead unlike any other, anybody else in history, that he is alive. God, we ask now that you, by your Holy Spirit, would speak to us through your word as we have joined together on this most special occasion today to celebrate your victory. God, draw us close to you, the one that is here separated from you, that today would be the day of salvation for them. Lord, we ask for you to move in this place by your spirit, in Christ's name, amen. If you're there with me in John chapter 20, verse 19, pick up with me in God's word. On the evening of that day, that is the, that Sunday that he was resurrected, on the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being locked 
where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them, verse 21, Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. Verse 23, If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you withhold forgiveness from any, it is withheld. Look down at verse 24 with me. Now Thomas, one of the twelve, called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see his hands, the mark of the nails, and place my finger into the mark of the nails, and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. Verse 26, eight days later, his disciples were inside again, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands, and put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. Verse 28, Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Three ways that we can experience the peace of the empty tomb. The first way that we see here in the scriptures Uh, The first reminder that God gives us in his word is that because of the empty tomb, God's peace can break into any situation, into any place. Because of of the empty tomb, no matter what we are going through, uh, Jesus can break in, in a good way, amen, and bring his peace into the midst of that situation. As Jesus entered this room, the Bible tells us that the disciples were hiding for fear of the Jews. Now you have to remember that it was just a few days earlier, three, as a matter of fact, just a few days earlier that these disciples who had been following Jesus for the last three to three and a half years of his life, they witnessed those who were quote unquote in charge take Jesus and have him put on trial, and have him whipped and beat publicly, and then shamefully executed publicly on a cross. And so they were fearful that if they did this to Jesus, who we followed, then perhaps we're next. And so they were afraid for fear of the Jews, and they were hiding Can I tell you what happened to these disciples? I think it's something that happens to us all the time. These disciples had forgotten that Jesus had promised that this would go exactly this way, that he would be crucified and he would die for our sins, for our wrongs to bring us into right relationship, that this didn't take Jesus by surprise. This was exactly God's plan. He had promised that this would happen, but even more. We got some new pad under this carpet. I might have to jump some today. Even more than that, that Jesus had promised that he would rise from the dead on the third day for our victory. They had forgotten God's promises. All that they could do was see the circumstances that were right in front of them. That ever happened to you? Get overwhelmed because of what's going through and you forget all those promises that God has made in his word. That's what happened to the disciples on that day. But praise God, Jesus broke in anyway. And When Jesus walked in, I I love the scene here. Uh, Jesus walks in and he kind of spooks the disciples. He says, peace be with y'all. They they say, ah! I I think that's how it went. I wasn't there. A uh, little theological commentary, uh, no, no charge. But Jesus comes in and 
speaks to them, peace be with you. What's he saying? He's saying, y'all chill out. Everything's under control. That Jesus was in charge and that they could trust in him. Here's why Jesus told them that, because God wants us to know that he wants us to live in his perfect peace no matter what we are going through. We don't have to live in fear or anxiety or worry or stress out all the time because Jesus overcame the grave and he can overcome what we're going through too. But so often we, for, we neglect to live in that peace because we forget God's promises too. But I want to remind you that it's this peace, the, this promise from God that inspires songs like Because He Lives. I can face tomorrow because he lives. All fear is gone because I know he holds the future. And life is worth the living because he lives. Don't miss this, though. When Jesus showed up twice in this passage, at least twice, John, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, reminds us that the doors weren't standing open. Jesus walked through, locked doors on two occasions on the first day when he raised from the grave and the and the others were there he walked through the locked door and then uh, about a week later when he shows up on the next Sunday and Thomas is there with him he walked through the locked doors again let me just take you on an excursion for just a minute I am so glad to know that God can do it again amen Jesus walked through the locked doors doors. Here, here's what that means. This points us to the sovereign power of God and the, and the authority of Jesus to break through and to bring us his perfect peace no matter what our situation or our circumstances may be. We can live in peace no matter our situation because Jesus has defeated the grave and God has given Jesus power and authority over every situation we could ever worry about. Let me tell you what that means. It means that if Jesus can, that if a locked door can't stop Jesus, a low stock market can't stop him either. Rising inflation can't stop Jesus. Wars and turmoil in the world can't stop Jesus. Let me tell you something. A pink slip from your employer can't stop Jesus. He's in charge. Shortages at the grocery store can't stop Jesus. And there's no need to be anxious about that because of the abundance of his peace. Amen? Just ask some Old Testament folks who were looking forward to his coming. The folks of Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They can tell you that corrupt politicians and bad legislation can't stop Jesus and a fire can't stop him either. A bad report from the doctor can't stop Jesus because he's the great physician that gets the final word over every situation for the believer who puts their their hope and their trust in him. No situation is too big or too bad for God to break through with the peace of the empty tomb. Listen, not even death could stop Jesus. And that means that you can walk through your door because he walked out of the tomb. Sometimes, though, you have to know that God doesn't promise to change our circumstance. Instead, he gives us peace in the midst of it. Why? Because there is a watching world that needs a witness to the power of his peace. I don't know about y'all, but one thing that I have thoroughly enjoyed that convinced me that I may be here for a lifetime as a transplant is this thing that Texas has got called Dairy Queen. Amen? <laughs> Dairy Queen wants you to know that they got the real deal going on. And so what they do, unlike their competitors that serve it up thin, what they do is they serve it up thick and they do it up right. And when they give it to you, they turn it upside down to let you know you got the real deal. God sometimes allows us to have our life turned upside down so that the world can know that the peace we have in the risen Savior through faith in him is the real deal. Here's the next truth that we see in this passage. The empty tomb reminds us that the peace of God is the church's primary objective. The peace of God is the church's primary objective. 
In verse 20 and 21, we see Jesus' first words to these disciples there in that room was, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, now I am sending you. Now listen, there are certain events in life that are so different from the norm that they get your attention and they make an impression. Maybe it's the vows you spoke to your spouse at your wedding. Maybe it was the first time you held your baby. Something different happened, and it got your attention and reminds you about what's really important. Maybe it was watching your kid graduate to begin their new life as, a, as an adult. Well, if there was ever a moment in history that was different than the norm, that ought to get our attention and to make an impression on us about what's really important. It's the first words of Jesus after he meets these disciples in this room that as the Father has sent me, so I am sending you the church who believes on me, on Jesus. The, 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 one, thing, the, the one thing that Jesus came to do was to bring our world Peace, but not just emotional peace, not just world peace and the e easing of conflicts, but peace of a reconciled a relationship with God through faith in Jesus where our hearts would be made right with God again and we would be His friends again. Listen, that's the main thing that Jesus wants His people to be known for is helping others come into a right relationship with Jesus as their Savior. McDonald's is known for three things. They're known for the golden arches. They're known for hot coffee. And they're known, well, that the ice cream machine never works. <laughs> Jesus wants his people to be known for one thing. Telling others about who he is. Here in verses 22 and 23, Jesus does and says some things that raise some questions for, for us. First, he breathes on the disciples and gives them the Holy Spirit. And then at first reading, uh, a mistaken reading would make it appear that Jesus has given authority to the church or to individuals to absolve people of their sin or to refuse to forgive others of their sin. What's going on in these verses? Look at verse 22 first with me again, where he breathes on them and they receive the Holy Spirit. Those of us who know the Bible's story know that after Jesus ascended, it was some 40 days later uh, that Jesus sent the Holy Spirit from heaven and the people of God were indwelt. So what has happened in this upper room? Here's what happened, that it was a down payment looking forward to the day of fulfillment where he would temporarily em embolden and empower the disciples to get them through until the Holy Spirit would come in fullness. But here's the difference. Six Acts chapter 2, every believer is permanently indwelt by the Holy Spirit to empower us for what he has called us to do. Then in verse 23, you have to understand that Jesus did not give the church or anybody else the ability to forgive people's sins or to withhold God's forgiveness from them. Only God can extend forgiveness, and he did it in Jesus to all who believe. What Jesus was doing was he was simply commissioning the church with their main message, telling them that the message of the gospel is that anyone who believes on Jesus is forgiven and to give a warning to all who disbelieve who choose to not believe that there is no forgiveness in any other way except through faith in Jesus. That's the mission Jesus gave us in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verses 18 through 20 when God reminds the church that he has made us ambassadors for Christ to reconcile people to God through the gospel mission. When I, was, uh, I used to love this show called Mission Impossible when the orders would be given out, it used to come in a, in a cassette uh, or uh, uh, some ticker tape on the machine, and it would say, this is your mission, should you choose to accept it. And it would tell what the mission was, and then you better get that thing out of your hands quick because it was going to blow up, it was going to burn up or something, because then it would warn you, this message will self-destruct in 10 seconds, and you better get rid of it. And then there was the music that I'll spare you from mission impossible. Can I tell you what God's telling us in his word here today? 
the mission of gospel advancement, seeing people come to know Jesus as their Savior, is not mission impossible. It is mission possible because of the Holy Spirit who lives in us, empowering us. So many people look at the size of the mission. They look at their unfamiliarity. Listen, if you have believed on Jesus, you have a testimony that he will empower if we will be faithful to tell. Here's the last truth that I want to share with you this morning. We can see his peace break in at any place, and it's our primary objective to make his peace known. But the peace of the empty tomb, look, man, it, it's got to be personally possessed. You have to choose individually to make this peace your own. Each one of us. Each one of us. That's the story of Thomas here in this upper room. The Bible tells us that the first, when Jesus first broke in, that Thomas wasn't there. And he had some questions. The, despite how uh, enthusiastic and uh, bold that his friends were that loved him and cared for him, Thomas said, look, I wasn't there. And I'm not going to believe until I can put my, hand in his fin- put my finger in his hand and put my hand in his side. I'll, I'll never believe. But I'm glad to know how God met Thomas right where he was. Because that's a picture of what Jesus does for us. No matter our past, no matter our hurt, no matter our guilt, our shame, our embarrassment about what may have happened in the past, that Jesus can show up right in the middle of where we're at in life to meet us there, to change our life forever through faith. That's what we see happens to Thomas. He had a moment of faith. Salvation's all about faith, about putting our whole life, our past and even our questions, in Jesus' hands, trusting in Him. Faith is simple. It, it's F-A-I-T-H. For all I trust Him. That's all faith is, is trusting Jesus. And I'm so glad to know that God moved in Thomas's heart to help him trust in Jesus because some of us, many of us maybe even, have family or friends or co-workers or neighbors that might just be just like Thomas was on this day that say that they'll never believe on Jesus. And God encourages us to not give up, to give God time, to keep praying and to keep sharing and keep trusting that despite what it looks like on the outside, that God is working in their heart to bring them to faith. Friend, I want to encourage you that if God can move Thomas to trust in Jesus, he can move our loved one's hearts too. Because what happened to Thomas, listen, it wasn't just agreeing with the facts. Lots of people saw the miracles that Jesus did in his ministry and yet chose to not believe. Thomas could have left this day unchanged. He could have said, well, there's no arguing with it. Something happened. There's no arguing with the fact, but still not have given his heart. But look at what he said. Did you hear what he said when he looked at Jesus, the risen Savior, and he said, my Lord and my God. This was a moment of faith where his heart was changed to give all of his heart and all of his faith to, sa- to the Savior and to be saved. Jesus closes and tell his, tells him, Have you believed because you've seen? Blessed are those who have believed and who have not yet seen. That's all of us. We weren't in that upper room either. But yet we can still have faith and trust in Jesus and be saved. But why faith? Because that's precisely what it's all about. It's about trusting Him. Many years ago, down in Mississippi, I heard the story of a gentleman who was on his way to a very important meeting, and he was driving all night to get there for the meeting the next day. And he comes up to a bridge, and there's fog so thick he can't see. And as he's driving up at the bridge, at the last minute, he sees that the bridge is out And the car plummets over and somehow he managed to survive and he climbed up the hill and he was crying out to cars passing by, the bridge is out, the bridge is out. But nobody listened to him. Nobody heard the warning. Friends, why does God want us to have faith? Because he knows, because he knows 
that our world has been so impacted by the fog of sin that if we only trust in what we see, it will lead to disaster for us. And God wants us instead to place our faith in Jesus and be saved. He rose him from the grave. And today that leads us to a decision that needs to be made. Today. The Bible says that today is the day of salvation. Some of us here today need Jesus as our Savior. Some of us today in this room would say, I've been to church, I've tried to be a good person, I've lived my life the very best that I could, but today it's, it's made sense in my heart for the very first time that I need to trust in Jesus for myself. And I believe that he died for me, and I believe that he's risen, and I want him to be my new boss. Here in just a moment, we're going to have a time where you can come forward, and you can just tell God that where you're at, but if, you have, if God is leading you to make that decision today, this church family wants to celebrate God's work in your life. Some of us here today that have gathered in this place, we are believers and we know the Lord as our Savior. Maybe the decision that we need to make today is to begin to say, Jesus, sign me up. If you want me to go, if you want me to use my testimony, I am trusting your empowerment to do it today. Is that you? Would you stand with me as we pray and we prepare for a time of...